Hi everyone, this is Jason Zydema from NAMA. NAMA, as you might know, exists to provide a network for encouragement, training, and coordination of ministries that serve port communities in North America. I see that a number of people are coming online right now. If you have questions, if you can't hear anything, please do uh, in the chat bar on, on your uh, GoToWebinar uh, panel, please in the chat bar ask me a question and uh, we'll try to sort it out uh, right away. I'm very privileged to offer this first in a series of short webinars with leaders in the field of seafarers welfare. Uh, information on future webinars will be shared in the coming days. These webinars are meant to be informative for those who have already been involved in seafarers welfare for some time, but also those who might not have that much experience. And at the outset, I want to express thanks to the chaplains of the Houston International Seafarer Center for their support of these webinars. Before introducing our special guest this morning, Dr. Helen Sampson, I'd like to say a few words about how the webinar will work. Uh, and as this is our first time publicly running a webinar via this system, uh, we are, I think, learning together how to best lead, uh, lead them. So for the first 30 minutes or so of this conversation, I'll ask some questions to Dr. Sampson that we have prepared together, and there'll be some slides that come with it. And then for the remaining time, if you have questions, uh, we, can, uh, we can ask those questions to Dr. Sampson. And the way it will work is, please uh, ask those questions to me in that sidebar uh, under chat. You can ask the questions, just send an, uh, send a, uh, uh, an email to the organizer and uh, uh, I'll see your name and I'll be able to ask the question along and uh, note your name and uh, Dr. Sampson then can answer the question if she, uh, she has some knowledge in that field. Let me introduce our speaker. I'm very, very happy that she's uh, with us today and she's been a wonderful, uh, um, a wonderful help in setting up this uh, uh, webinar. Dr. Helen Sampson has been director of the Seafarers International Research Center of Cardiff University since 2003. And at CERC, Professor Sampson's research interests have been broad and have developed in relation to multinational crewing, training, women seafarers, the impact of changing technology on seafarers' work, issues of regulation, family life, globalization, and seafarer health and safety, obviously broad interests, and uh, interests that correspond to many of the interests that those of us who work in seafarers' welfare uh, are, are interested in. Uh, particularly, and one of the big reasons why I wanted to ask her to be on uh, with us for this webinar, is that her recent book, uh, International Seafarers and Transnationalism in the 21st Century, and we'll get into that title in a second to help uh, better understand it, but that book recently came out, and I think it's a wonderful book for anyone involved in seafarers' welfare to read and to understand. I think it should be on the top of your reading lists uh, if you want to better understand seafarers' welfare and the dynamics of seafarers' life um, at this time. So without further ado, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Sampson. Thank you for being with us today. Hello. It's nice to be with you. Thank you very much, Chase. Uh, as we begin, I'd, I'd like to get a better sense of CERC. Can you tell us a little bit about CERC and, and what, why it exists and how you got involved? Um, CERC has uh, been around for a long time. Um, it's, it was set up in 1995, um, and um, uh, the centre was set up with money from the ITF Seafarers Trust initially to look at issues of seafarers health and safety um, and welfare. And we, over the years, have broadened that definition quite a, a, a great deal, um, so that when we think about seafarers welfare, we um, are interested in issues of um, regulation of seafarers, health and safety conditions, um, what goes on on board ship, and transnationalism, which is obviously the focus of the book and I think something we're going to talk about, um, and, and um, all those other kinds of areas, some of which you outlined in relation to my interests, such as women seafarers and their specific issues, um, family life we've been very interested in, um, and um, and uh, sort of contemporary issues about re re regulation which um, may not seem directly to relate to seafarers welfare when you first look at them like the regulation of ship emissions for example and pollution 
but actually they impact on seafarers' work on board ships and how they do their work. So, so we really have um, broadened over the last kind of 20 years um, to, to consider um, a lot of issues that are re related to seafarers. And we try to be very outwardly facing. So um, as you see on the slide here, this is our website, um, which we've tried to turn into a resource um, for students, for people who work in the welfare sector, for the industry in general. Um, and, um, and through those links on the website, you can in fact um, download a lot of free reports um, a lot of journal articles that are available um, uh, on an open access basis and so on. So um, I just thought that it might be interesting for people um, to take a look at the website sometime and maybe make use of some of those resources. would be really happy if they were to do it. Most of them are free. Where they're not free, it's not payment to us. It's maybe payment to a journal or something that has copyright. Um, but uh, wherever we can, we, we make the resources there and easily found and, um, and uh, free. I've used many of them myself. Um, one of the the uh, new resources that you've made, which is not free, but it's uh, but one, what's wonderful is it's now out in paperback. Uh, that is your new book, uh, International Seafarers and Transnationalism in the 21st Century. Uh, that book is is really wonderful, uh, and I'd love if you could give a um, a, a real, a, a simplified version of the basic argument of your book. What, what is transnationalism and what does that have to do with seafarers? Transnationalism um, is quite a mouthful, but apart from being a mouthful, um, it's, it's an interesting idea about contemporary life. Um, you know, many years gone by, gone, uh, we used to see people leaving their home country and moving to a new country. Um, and they would that would entail severing links. So when people sailed from the UK across to the States and Canada, um, uh, you know, they, they lost contact very often with their families to all intents and purposes. There might be the occasional communication, but it was, you know, took a long time to, to, to get communication from one side of the Atlantic to another. And people generally lost touch with the homelands that they, that they had left and they integrated um, into, over time in the in the new countries that they, they traveled to. And that was really the pattern for migration over a number of centuries. Um, but in the last, um, I guess the last 50 years of, of the previous century, um, what we began to see, of course, was the speed up of communications and um, uh, especially in the latter part of the 20th century, we saw uh, much cheaper air travel and so on. And, and this started, and now we have Skype and things like this wonderful webinar. Um, and this, this kind of uh, communications revolution, as well as um, this, the, the kind of compression of the world, if you like, um, so that the world seems to become smaller because we can, we can get across it quicker and more cheaply. Um, this meant that suddenly those large distances in time and space um, didn't, didn't really, they contracted, they didn't, they didn't really have such significance. And, and people began to theorize that maybe this would mean that, that um, we had a new kind of migrant who could move into a new society without losing the contact with their previous society, their, their homeland. And of course, um, in this period, we also see globalization and a lot more workers moving abroad. Um, so if we pick a country like the Philippines, um, you know, a huge part of their economy, is, is, as your uh, listeners will know, is based on remittances. So there are whole um, countries which, which are, the, the economies are really sort of largely based on sending workers abroad for periods of time and then them coming back. Um, so different patterns of migration, new kind of patterns of migration. And a very beguiling idea that you could migrate without fully leaving your country so that you could sort of exist in terms of your life in, in more than one place, really. So that um, if I go and work on board a ship to bring it to seafarers, um, the idea would be that I wouldn't necessarily lose contact with my with my home, with my family, with my community, that I could kind of have one foot on the ship and one foot back at home simultaneously, really, that, that, that my place and my understanding and my, my role in those communities could, could kind of be, happen at the same time. So it's a beguiling idea. Um, uh, sadly, my research really um, shows that in, in the case of seafaring, um, 
despite the fact that seafarers leave their communities for relatively short periods of time and return re relatively regularly, um, it isn't really um, reasonable to characterize that existence as a transnational existence, um, but rather an existence where seafarers over time, not I don't mean just after one voyage, but you know when they keep going back to sea, they tend to really lose their place in their communities to to a great extent and family relationships and friendships um, suffer and they, 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 they can end up rather dispossessed really as, hmm. you know rather as if they don't belong anywhere they don't belong on the ship they don't belong at home anymore um, um, which is the worst case kind of scenario so instead of a double belonging there's a kind of double exclusion um, and that's that's really what that idea is all about just yeah. before you move on yeah. I should just say, because you're saying it's nice the paperback's out, it's considerably cheaper than the hardback. Yes. Uh, but there's also an offer on um, in conjunction with a, a big maritime conference uh, that's coming up in Manila, um, which is for a half price paperback. So it makes it slightly cheaper again. So, so, so if and, anybody wants to buy the book, it would be a good time to buy it, and they can always contact uh, so for the code, the promotion code for that. Uh, I was, I was going to say, anyone who wants to travel to Manila to get half price on her book. Uh, <laughs> no, no, they don't have to travel to Manila. They just have to contact Sir, and we'll sort it out. Yeah. No, thank you. In, uh, what I'd like to do is focus a couple of questions now on Chapter 5 of your book. And in, uh, in Chapter 5, it talks about the, the life of a modern seafarer and uh, some of the dynamics that are, uh, that, are, that are changing, but things that are, that are very important. One, one is and has been there for, for a long time, but I, I'd love you to just give a, a, a brief overview of hierarchy on board a ship. Some of our listeners might not necessarily know ship life that well. I wonder if you could explain hierarchy and, uh, the hierarchy on board a ship and, and what dynamics that creates uh, in, in the group. Hierarchy on board a ship is, is um, one of the things that kind of hits you most strongly um, uh, when you go on board as an observer, um, as, as, as I have um, on many ships. And, and it's also a thing that patterns all ships, it seems to me, very strongly. Um, and uh, it's a very similar and recognizable pattern that you see when you go from ship to ship. So regardless of the company, regardless of the nationalities, um, you, know, you, you have similar jobs on board. And of course, the hierarchy, occupational hierarchy, um, uh, the pattern stays the same. So, um, if you <coughs> if you have a look at this slide um, that I'm showing now, um, the the top four, as they're often referred to, are, are shown on the left. They're the most senior officers. The captain on board the ship, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is um, is the same rank as a chief engineer, but actually is the person who has overall responsibility for the ship. Um, and so in relation to welfare issues and social issues, it's the captain who um, is, is in charge, um, really. The chief engineer, same rank, in charge of the engine department, but doesn't have that um, you know, whole ship kind of uh, purview. Um, the chief officer and first um, engineer, who is sometimes confusingly called the second engineer just to keep us on our toes, um, is uh, is their, their, their second in command basically the, the chief officer will have um, uh, responsibility for setting the work of the ratings the deck ratings um, but um, but rather oddly the chief officer the second officer and the third officer because they keep separate navigational watches and they have rather separate responsibilities they don't really work together as a team so they're quite individual roles really um, Chief Officer does work a little bit as the team leader with the, the ratings, the debt ratings. The first engineer works to the chief engineer and is in charge of all the engineers. So they have a much more kind of team uh, kind of life. Um, and, um, and all these things kind of do play through to other areas of life on board ships. So they, they are important in a way. Um, so the, the, the kind of... Um, the kind of key people, if you look at that, that hierarchy chart, um, uh, in terms of being team leaders, um, and that also works through, as I say, into other aspects of social life, are the captain, um, the chief officer, I would say. The bosun is very important because the bosun um, is in charge as a supervisor of the ratings 
and it's the bosun who goes to the chief officer for the orders every every day um, and um, and the bosun is a mediating influence between the ratings and the senior officers so if I have a problem as an AB on board a ship the chances are that I would go to my bosun and talk about it I wouldn't go straight to the chief officer and I certainly wouldn't go straight to the captain usually so the, the hierarchy is incredibly rigid um, and um, the, pe the way that people exercise their roles of course varies so some people may take a very autocratic kind of approach so you get very autocratic captains who are very unapproachable and then you may have other captains who who would like to be much more approachable and they, they do you know do make, take steps to be um, friendly and so on but there's still nevertheless there is this very very um, big gap really between lower ranking members of the, the crew and the senior senior officers um, and, it, and it's a gap which which never seems to be overcome except a little bit more amongst the engineers where you get this team working effect um, <coughs> a little bit more but um, so there's a very strong hierarchy that doesn't just define the work moments on board a ship but because I suppose in some ways it's very hard to um, differentiate between the work and social life in a small institution environment in these very small groups there are these very strong lines of authority and, um, and, and remoteness really so it does carve up the crew even though the crew is very small um, so they may all same, they may all be in the same boat <laughs> but you know sometimes they don't even um, speak to each other um, so so uh, I have been on board ships where where an engineer once said to me um, uh, because we arranged a barbecue that was because I was there uh, I haven't even met some of these people before and we're mm -hmm. talking about a crew of maybe 20 people mm -hmm. so it's very hierarchical and, um, and very separated in that way in, in on one of the pages of your chapter you say that as it's typically referred the captain is king on the ship can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a captain uh, on a ship and what are the dynamics of that life um, uh, on board? <coughs> I think the role of a captain, um, especially in port, which might be where some of um, your listeners would, would encounter captains, um, uh, is, is extremely stressful today. Um, and, uh, and they have responsibility, obviously, for the health and safety on board the ship, but they also have responsibility for dealing with all the people who come to the ship from the shore side. Um, they have um, generally um, a lot of contact with the office as well. Um, and, um, and there are different sorts of captains that exercise their authority in different ways. But some of them will also take a, a very keen interest in, in actually what happens on board the ship um, socially and so on. Um, and and others will be be less interested. But it's it's a very high pressure role. It's a role obviously everyone's familiar with the fact that captains can be incarcerated um, for various breaches of regulation. Um, they are very conscious of that. Um, it's it's a role in which they have responsibility for the lives of those on board ships. Um, and. Um, and I think there are some interesting things about the roles that have been shown up in recent events on passenger um, vessels. I mean, you've got the Korean ferry that that sank and um, the Korean captain on trial at the moment. Um, and, and of course, we had um, Captain Scatinio of the um, Costa Concordia, um, both of whom are accused of sort of dere dereliction of duty. Um, and, and when that happens, I think it makes us suddenly aware that this is a very unusual job because this is a job where actually um, there is an expectation that you will um, sacrifice your own interests and possibly your own life um, uh, in favour of the lives and interests of, of certain passengers on board ships. But that also applies on a merchant vessel. You know, you do have responsibility for those lives on board. So, um, so one of the things that that means is that captains can be very uh, distant from and separate from their their crew they have all this responsibility they also have to try to make the ship work um, they also have a huge amount of power because they are the link with the office and so 
Um, there are a couple of quotes on the screen now, which really shows you a little bit of, of how captains um, are seen sometimes by crew. Um, so this first one is really to, uh, an AB talking about how he is, is afraid of the captain. Um, so I, the question that I'd asked him was, you know, is there anyone on board that you avoid? Okay, and his answer was only the captain. I'm, I'm really scared of the captain. So he just tried to keep out of the way of the captain altogether um, and was worried that, that, you know, he might inadvertently be seen to do something um, that, that would upset the captain. Um, and, and this is this is the quote below really gives you an indication of why that would be, um, because um, in this particular case the the Kiora was a rather unpleasant captain on board, um, who everybody was afraid of. Um, he was a, he was a bully. He, he shouted at people a lot. Shouted at me, um, and um, and uh, they were afraid of him basically because. Um, they were afraid that he, he would have them dismissed and he would be overt in that threat. He would tell them that he could have them sent home on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I've been on ships where people have been sent home um, while I was on board um, for, for, for things that they, you know, professional um, uh, poor conduct um, that, that they had uh, carried out. So, for example, the very first ship I was on, an engineer was sent home from Argentina because he hadn't been able to start a lifeboat in a lifeboat drill, um, and and that was um, undermined his his whole credibility as an engineer. So so the captain does have that authority and does you know it's not it's not like being in a university or something like that where there's due process that has to be gone through and that you're protected by a union and so on. Um, you can just be sent home, um, and and of course seafarers whose jobs. Um, the job they can get on board a ship, so say you're a Filipino, um, you know, to, to be paid a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month on board a ship is so much more than you would be able to get with equivalent qualifications ashore. That the jobs have this huge significance and importance for people, so they are they are very 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 afraid of of losing their job, especially as they may never work at sea again if that happens. So so the captain is regarded as this kind of um, very powerful figure who you don't want to get on the wrong side of. Equally, he feels, usually he, sometimes she, um, feels that they have to maintain a kind of distance between themselves and the crew so that they can maintain authority. Um, and that means that they are often rather remote people, um, rather lonely people. They become lonely either because people push them away because they're avoiding them, um, or, or because they actually maintain that distance themselves um, on board. But of course that means that half their life, their working life, is really a rather lonely um, and, and remote one. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of time and I, I wanted to ask a few more questions about uh, chief officers or others, but what I'd like to ask, it's something that's sort of come up, but we've sort of touched on, is communication among the crew, but also with their families. And key to that, and increasingly, as many of our CFARs welfare people know, is internet and internet availability. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, the state of internet access and why the remoteless, re remoteness of life on board ship, how, how that affects things. And um, if you could go over some numbers and, and comment on, on what that means for life on a ship. Um, the, the very first um, ship I went on in 1999 had a kind of email access. Um, you, you had to send your email through the ship's captain, so it wasn't very private. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a supposedly a kind of dedicated account, and um, it was a Swedish ship, and so it was a bit ahead of the game, really. But um, uh, I was a bit shocked to go from that, this uh, ship with some kind of connection with the outside world, to a ship where there was no um, uh, connection with the outside world at all for the ordinary seafarer or for me as a researcher. Um, and, um, and the only kind of communication I had with my family on board that ship was when we passed Las Palmas radio and you could sort of do a, a, a two-way radio kind of broadcast um, that was public, it was on the bridge. Um, and that kind of variation in experience is still remarkably really, given how much time has passed since then, is still there. Um, and so internet access, although it's, um, you know, technologically entirely possible, um, is, is not widespread on ships. So if you look at this pie chart, 
This is from research that we did in 2012, um, over 1,500 questionnaires to seafarers, so quite a big sample. Um, and we found that 61% of, of respondents didn't have any internet access on board. Um, that, that's improved a little bit, but the figure isn't very different uh, a couple of years on. Um, and then you see that there's also um, a difference between uh, having no internet access or having some internet access but on various conditions. And, and, um, and very few seafarers were reporting free and unlimited access, 12%. Um, now on the ships that I've been on, um, where they've had free and unlimited access, uh, which is, I think there's only one ship I've been on like that, um, it made the most, the huge, you know, huge difference to the to the atmosphere on board ship. The ship seemed like such a, a normal workplace compared with other ships that I've been on. I mean, that regular contact with family, being able to Skype family and actually see them, um, it, 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 I, I can't begin to describe the powerful effect that that has um, on seafarers um, and the relationships they have with their family. Um, but internet access isn't, of course, um, um, the only the only kind of access you can have. You can have email access of different sorts as well. But internet access is important. And and what we found in that survey was that it's very differentiated by by ship type, which is what this this um, this bar chart shows you. Um, so you can see that um, bulk carriers, which are generally um, amongst some of the worst kind of ships that are around in terms of their general quality, I guess, for seafarers um, and seafarer safety. <coughs> They're also, um, you know, very poor in terms of internet access. Um, and and you see, obviously, on um, passenger ships where such facilities are probably available for the passengers, seafarers often do get some sort of restricted access um, to internet. But bulk carriers, cargo ships, and to a lesser extent tankers, where the access is a little bit better, um, are not are not very well provided for in terms of internet access. <coughs> this um, this pie chart shows you what I was referring to earlier, which is that of course there is some sort of different sort of um, email access um, on ships which don't have internet access. So those ships that have internet access really have the whole you know it might be slow, but they really do have um, access to the web. Um, whereas other seafarers may be allowed to use the ship's communication systems to send email a little bit um, like I, I described from my first ship. You know, you'd have an account that would go through the captain or whatever. So it's not really private um, and it's, it's only limited to email. You often can't send attachments, you can't send photographs, can't send videos, that sort of thing. Um, but um, uh, you can see from this that only 41% of seafarers reported having no access to that sort of communication at all. It's still quite a large number of seafarers, if you think about mm -hmm. it. Um, but um, but it, it, at least um, at least a few more than the forty percent um, uh, have some have some access to email, um, even though um, only forty percent had access to internet. So sixty percent access to email, forty percent access to the internet, um, and then. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is to look at differences in nationalities. So um, the, the email access, the pattern that as it differentiates between ship types is more or less the same for internet access. So we, we looked at that already. But if you look at this um, bar chart, you'll see that Chinese seafarers in particular um, report very poor email access um, and, and Filipinos as well. Um, so a little bit better for European seafarers. I think you can take the British as a kind of proxy for that um, in this chart, and a little bit better for Indian seafarers as well, who are usually officers um, more often in the global fleet. But um, but we did find that pattern repeated throughout the survey. Actually, is that Chinese seafarers seem to be getting a very raw deal in terms of a lot of terms and conditions on board ship, and certainly didn't have good access to to email. Um. I'd like to ask a question that's a sort of follow-up to that, uh, a, a, a two-part question. The, the first part uh, goes back to some of the beginning of our discussion about uh, the hierarchy on board a ship and the, the professional life, the structure of professional life. How does the structure of professional life on board a ship leave an imprint on the, the structure of social life or, or downtime? 
And then the, the second question following right up on that is, with with the 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 uh, the increasing, I, I would I would say availability of internet on board ships, even if it's slowly increasing, uh, how does that have an effect on social life? We we've often heard that seafarers don't get a chance to go. Um, you know, they they spend their time their downtime in front of a screen rather than spending time together. That's a that's a common thing that that is heard. What would you say to in how is a, how is their social life affected by their professional life in general? And more specifically, um, in, in uh, downtime, uh, how does the internet um, affect their, their, their downtime or screen, screens in general? I think um, the, the, um, the way in which professional life affects social life is really marked on a ship. Um, if you go to any social event on board the ship, it, it's probably only happening because the captain and the officers have, have sanctioned it in the first place, um, especially if it's a whole ship event. Um, it will almost always take place in rating space, not officer space. Um, when the senior officers are present, the whole atmosphere of the event is different. So people clearly feel that they are with their managers. They don't feel they're with their mates. Um, and until the managers go, then you may have a general kind of relaxing. And, and that's especially the case for the captain. Um, strangely, the, perhaps because of this team working that I have mentioned before amongst the, chief, the engineers, strangely the chief engineer can sometimes not have that influence on the crew. But you do see in these social gatherings how work relationships are really important. And, and you know, you're, you're never away from that as a seafarer on board a ship. It's why I think one of the reasons why it really is so important that seafarers have a chance to get away from the ship sometimes, um, which as you mentioned is, is more and more difficult for them, but um, it, it is important because that is actually in maybe nine months, that or 10 months, 12 months, that might be the only chance you get away from your managers. And, um, and really, you know, most of us who don't have to spend a lot of time with our managers um, probably, probably find it hard to imagine if we suddenly did. But also, you know, it, it's it's really quite oppressive. I think it means you never can just let your hair down and be yourself. Um, you may not want to do anything particularly outrageous, but we do generally behave differently in our work kind of personas and in front of our managers than we do otherwise. So, um, <clears throat> the the professional life does really impact on the social life in that way. There's a quote here, which um. Although it wasn't about, you know, I didn't ask a question that, that led to, uh, on the same topic and um, that led to this quote. Um, I think it does show, if we unpick it um, a little bit, um, uh, of what I'm trying to dis describe. So this um, this uh, first engineer is actually talking about what it's like to work with your own nationality, um, and he prefers working with multinational crews. And he explains that that's because when he's with um, the same nationality, um, uh, you have friendships that, that emerge and, um, and that this disrupts the professional distance that he feels he needs to keep on board a ship. And so I, I think that kind of highlights for us, you know, he would prefer to work with people who he can keep at arm's length because that makes life easier um, in terms of his, his work role. Um, than, than to work with people of his his culture um, with whom he can have closer relationships. I think that shows in a way how significant um, the, the professional um, relationships are on board and, and how um, keen seafarers are to, to, um, to try to maintain them really, how it makes their life easier to maintain them. Of course that is totally at the, at the cost of good social relationships sometimes. Um, and that, that also works at the level of nationality. I mean, this is this is a picture that I took, a photograph that I took of a barbecue, which is an increasingly rare event these days, but this was in 1999 on the very first ship I was on. Uh, since then, every time I look at nationality, I see the same patterns kind of emerging. But this is a nationality divide, but it's also a hierarchical divide. So this is a social event. People can sit where they would like. But as you see, the... the um, the people in the foreground are all um, Eurasian, um, Eurasian, are all Caucasian, and um, and are the Swedish um, senior officers, 
Um, and the people in the background are all Asian um, and are more junior officers and, and ratings or Filipinos. And, and the, the gaps around the senior officers are quite significant if, if, if you look at that photograph. They have a lot of space around them. The, the Filipinos are kind of all crowded in at the end. So they would rather sit all kind of bunched together away from the senior officers than be, be mixing really with them. And <clears throat> I think that basically um, does illustrate something very significant about social life on board and the way that working relationships really are what a ship is all about. You know, there's, there are occasions where people will make good friendships on board a ship, but they're quite rare um, and they're quite dangerous because they're risky. If you become close to somebody, there's also a chance you might fall out with them. So it's safer in some way to have that kind of professional distance, to be a bit of a, a loner and so on. You asked me um, about internet access and whether or not that means people spend all their time um, looking at screens. Yeah. <coughs> I think yeah. one of the big one of the big changes um, uh, on ships is actually to do with the fact that um, increasingly events like this barbecues may be a banned for health and safety reasons. So when I first started going on ships as a researcher on a tanker, you can have a barbecue. These days, the seafarers point out that there are sparks coming out the funnel of the tanker, but uh, they're not allowed a barbecue on the decks. It's regarded as a health and safety hazard. Um, it's not really much fun pretending to have a barbecue inside. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're, they're often dry ships, again, especially tankers, so tankers get a bit of a double whammy in this respect. Um, but ships increasingly are dry, so you'll see that in this photograph we have wine being drunk and beer, um, all in moderation, but it, it kind of gives a kind of cohesion, especially for some cultures, um, and a reason for getting together. Uh, I have been on a ship where I tried to organise a Coca-Cola party and it really didn't didn't work for the, the people on board. Um, and um, so so that idea of getting together in the bar with a cold beer or whatever it is that that is lost from many ships now because there is no bar. There is and they haven't replaced it with a cafeteria. You can't go and get together for a latte as we might do down at Starbucks or whatever. There's nothing to replace it. So um, the, the the things that get people together are are not um, not there in the same way. Um, even if you look at this graph, again from that, that survey we did, even DVDs not necessarily available on board ships. I mean, we kind of assume that that is the basic standard, at least there'll be a DVD library, but you can see there that that's not necessarily the case. More than 20% of ships um, didn't have DVD library um, on board. Um, and captains are not very well trained uh, to think about the social life of the ship, it's all about work. So they don't think necessarily about making use of the resources that might be there to get people together still. So, you know, if there's a dance board, you can arrange a dance competition. Um, but if nobody, if the captain doesn't kind of take that initiative, it tends not to happen. Um, so sometimes you do see no facilities at all, and that really means that people don't get together. And they probably don't have internet access either. Um, or you, you may see some facilities that are not being well used which is generally because the officers need to drive that um, and, uh, and they often don't appreciate why it's beneficial to do that. But I've seen, I've seen barbecues disappearing, the, 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 the um, uh, access to beer and so on disappearing and, um, and uh, uh, other sort of communal type facilities like swimming pools and um, which could be a, a, a locus of fun um, <laughs> and uh, table tennis and all kinds of things which might bring people together. A lot of these things are vanishing from ships and, and that is having a deleterious effect. So I don't think it's a good argument to say we shouldn't give internet access because it makes everyone go to their screens. I would like to see internet access plus other things being done. Um, but I think what has happened is cargo space is being prioritised over social space. Nobody's giving much thought to, to social activities and resources, and it's, it's a real problem for seafarers. We only have a couple minutes left. Uh, I, uh, one of the comments that, that we made in a previous um, uh, discussion was that if you could make it in 30 seconds or less about uh, the in um, many mess rooms, 
the the internet and being together in in front of screens if that's the only place where Wi-Fi is available actually brings people together. Uh, I mean that, that's right. Um, sometimes internet access is provided in communal areas, and then people will will um, sort of be around together more. Um, last trip I was on, they had really small lounges, so I mean that in itself prevents people from getting together because there just aren't enough chairs for people and so on. We have one question from 